Scientists have always wanted to classify things, to divide them up into meaningful groups. We all do this every day when we speak about human races or give names to the plants we grow in our gardens. But to do this efficiently needs years of experience, years of working with the things we want to classify. And it's now just 40 years since scientists first began to try to use mathematical methods to help them. The first workers in this field were interested in land survey problems. The things they classified were sample plots of land, and the things they knew about them were the names of the plants growing in their plots. Seedling here, I don't know what that is. It'll be hypercarous, I think. Later, much later, botanists began classifying the plants themselves by mathematical methods. They might get their data from living plants like these, or from pressed specimens in a herbarium. Sociologists have wanted to classify the suburbs of Melbourne. Criminologists, trying to understand the causes of crime, have wanted to classify delinquents. Whatever we're classifying, we always finish up with a table. A table with a list of things to be classified, the individuals down one side, in this case they're chemical firms, and a list of the things we know about them, the attributes, down the other. This is the form in which the data is usually brought into the computer building. But the data must now be transcribed into a form in which the computer can interpret it. There's no universal standard form for this. Sometimes it's simple, as it is if it's just a list of the plants growing in each plot. Or more complicated, as it has to be, if you have information about soils at different levels. Now this table has to be transferred to punched cards. The cards must be checked. This is done not by laboriously proofreading them, but by a different worker punching them again on a machine called a verifier. This will detect any discrepancy between the two punchings. No existing computer has a program for classification automatically built in. So the computer must be provided with a set of cards, the program, which will tell it what mathematical operations are to be carried out. The data cards are added. Finally, a job card for record purposes. And the deck of cards is ready to be taken to the computer itself. There will already be other jobs being processed on the computer. The operators can, if they need, find out what the computer is doing at any moment by watching the control console.
Eventually, it's our program's turn. This card reader will read in up to 1,200 cards a minute. The information they contain is passed to the core store, the heart of the computer. Some of the information may need to be stored on magnetic tape for use later in the calculation. The arithmetic unit now begins to calculate a measure of similarity or likeness between every pair of individuals and it will then sort them into groups. When the calculations are finished, the answer is passed to a line printer, which operates at a thousand lines a minute. This printed output is taken away for examination. It normally gives first the program. Then it records where the various parts of the program were located in the store. Then it prints out the data so that the user can check once more that no mistakes have been made in the data fed in. Lastly, the results in a printed form. These brief results really describe a hierarchy, a family tree which shows the most alike individuals fusing at the bottom into groups and then these groups fusing together in their turn, and so on. We needn't draw this out by hand. There's a graph plotter which will do it for us. Or we can ask for the hierarchy to be built up on a visual display. Here is our hierarchy. The computation is finished and we have our answer. But it isn't the only answer we could get. We could read in the same data cards and by changing only one mathematical quantity in the machine, get a whole set of different answers. Let us look at another hierarchy from a set of field data. The plots obviously fall into two sharp groups. We'll ask the computer to repeat the calculation several times, changing only one simple instruction. Note as we go through these different answers how the scale changes and how first the grouping becomes less intense. Grouping becomes weaker and weaker. And finally the plots appear not to be grouped at all. Now, which of all these possible answers are we to choose? We normally provide a classification like this one, with a modest degree of grouping and the scale put on the side. But since it's only one of an infinite set of possible answers, the classification must be tested for usefulness or meaning in the context from which it came. Wherever it started, there it must end. And if the process began by the collection of data in the field, then the worker must return to the field to find out what its application means. A computer classification must never, in any circumstances, finish at the computer.